I just wanted to take this opportunity to uh, welcome you all here today. Um, my name is Jo Cohen. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of History here at QM, and it's been my pleasure to meet most of you in the room already today, um, as this is the inaugural uh, uh, address of our uh, postgraduate exchange in visual and material culture. And we have already enjoyed uh, this afternoon an amazing uh, sort of hands-on physical experience with uh, Dr. Jenny Thorne uh, from the Victorian Albert Museum. Uh, she demonstrated drawing in lime and hair uh, with uh, plaster work, and given the sort of buzz that we've had since we've come back from that, uh, you can, I hope there's a sense in the room that we're already very excited about this event. And so it's with great pleasure that I now hand us over to the next great event of this exchange, which is um, the keynote lecture by uh, Dr. Zara Anders Hansen. Um, before I say a bit more about her, what I just wanted to do is take a few minutes uh, to say some thank yous about sort of to the people who have made this possible. And the first is actually to Zara herself. Um, she has sort of helped very much. We have together crafted this enterprise of uh, making a postgraduate exchange in visual and material culture possible, um, not just creatively, but Financially, Zara has brought uh, the sort of funding uh, of, for four bursaries for QM students to participate in this exchange, which is a phenomenal undertaking. So on behalf of Queen Mary, thank you, Zara, but also uh, Catherine Dan Graber and uh, Tom Glider from Winterthur um, for making this possible for us. Um, I also wanted to say thank you very much to our graduate students for you know, agreeing to participate. I think we all know how precious uh, time is, and it can feel very uh, sort of enticing to kind of get tunnel visioned about the project. But what a what a brilliant and wonderful thing to be able to get our heads up uh, and exchange our knowledge, our passion for our subjects, um, and to sort of have this opportunity to create sort of new partnerships uh, with knowledge and expertise. And I also wanted to say thank you to the School of History, particularly you, Julian, hence the impeccable timing, for <laughs> helping to make this possible. Because, of course, all of these exchanges uh, require sponsorship in the best sort of uh, craftsmanship kind. We need our patrons. And, um, mm -hmm. and Queen Mary has been a patron for this as well. So um, my only other final thank you, and he's studiously looking out the window, is to Sam Bennett. Um, <laughs> He has made all of the running of today uh, and also the running of the rest of this exchange completely possible. Um, and I just wanted to say uh, thank you to him particularly. Can we just have a little round of applause? <laughs> it's a complete pleasure to work with you, so thank you, Sam. All right, now the delightful task of introducing Zara. Uh, she is an Associate Professor of History and Art History at the University of Delaware where she recently joined the department. Before that, and this is where I met her, she was a Barra a Fellow at the McNeil Center of Early American Studies, but she has also been, and the list is long, a Patrick Henry Postdoctoral Fellow at Johns Hopkins, uh, a recipient of fellowships from the ACLS, the Henry Luce Foundation, uh, the New York Historical Society, the Huntington Library, Mount Vernon Association. She says the Mount Vernon Association was her favorite one so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's because I'm still on it, later. I had to say it. <laughs> <laughs> She is also the author of a Portrait of a Woman in Silk, Hidden Histories of the Atlantic World, which came out with Yale University Press in 2016, but is already scheduled to be out in paperback uh, in September. Is that right? It's out already. Oh, it's out already. Yes. My goodness, that is how quickly it went. So if you want to pick up a copy after the lecture, you know, get onto Amazon. <laughs> um, her work, uh, both in that book, but also in her other articles and essays, offer really new and important interpretations of Atlantic world history and also early American history, revolutionary history. But given our purpose here today, I think it's more pertinent to say that she is already recognized as a scholar who is modeling new and important methodological approaches to the history of material culture. And um, you can read the blurbs on the book to know that, but read the book and it will become apparent uh, immediately. So today I'm sure we're going to get a chance to see some of those methodologies at work. Uh, she's talking about her new project, or one of her new projects actually, Domesticating Revolution, Patriotic Women, Military Men, and the Material Culture of Bringing Battle into the Home. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Well, I too have to start out with some thanks. Um, first is to Joanna Cohen, who um, I will return the compliment and say has 
managed to pull off a wonderful few days in London for all of us involved. So thank you so much for that. And thank you to Queen Mary um, History for also sponsoring this event. We greatly appreciate it from across the pond. Um, I also need to thank the University of Delaware's um, Winter Tour Program in American Material Culture because Catherine Dan Rober and Tom Geiler have very generously given over the most precious commodity on their British design history, which is time, um, in that course to join us for this, so I really appreciate that. And also the Center for Material Culture Studies at the university, which has sponsored a number of our doctoral students to be here today. So thank you to both institutions for their, for their sponsorship. Um, I would also like to thank in particular um, the graduate students who are here um, from both sides of the pond. Um, this really is about you. This is really about forging international networks and connections for you. And so, you know, we very much look forward to you being the stars of tomorrow um, and of this conference writ large. And one of the reasons that I'm presenting um, some of my newest work is that uh, it brings to mind Something I heard that I found very inspirational when I was in my early 20s attending a symphony, and it was a new piece that had just been released, and the conductor said, I'd like to remind you that all classical music was new once. And that really <laughs> stuck with me. And the reason I say that is, I'd like to remind you graduate students that all of your professor's work was new once. So as you work on your own projects, um, I thought it would be helpful for you to get something that is you know, one of my newer pieces that, um, that is pretty much done in terms of the research, but which is still percolating in terms of the thoughts in my head. And so I look very much forward to the collective wisdom of the Q&A in this room. Um, I have to say that the one person that I will not say thanks to is Jenny Sant, because she gave an absolutely stunning presentation. It is really awful to follow that. So <laughs> Jenny, I'm not happy about that. But otherwise, thank all of you for being here. Um, and I mentioned that I'm really excited about the transatlantic international collaborative work that I hope this conference and our upcoming exchange in the fall will bring. And so I realized it's probably a little bit perverse that I chose to <laughs> present a topic about the American Revolution, which after all <laughs> broke the ties um, structurally between the United States and Great Britain. So with apologies for the fact that I'm focusing on our war of independence, um, I will proceed. <laughs> Among the casualties of the Battle of Monmouth in New Jersey in 1778 was Captain Thomas Arnold's left leg. Wounded by a musket ball, the leg had to be amputated. Arnold, a patriot soldier in the 1st Rhode Island Regiment, sent the musket ball that hit him home. There his wife, Sarah Pierce Arnold, had it made into a necklace of beads. Now this jewelry fashioned from armed conflict was a thing that brought a reminder of violence into a domestic setting, a physical prompt for Arnold's wife to recount tales of the battle and her soldier husband's patriotic sacrifice. This weapon turned jewelry simultaneously served as patriotic mnemonic device and battlefield relic. Captain Arnold survived the revolution, serving in the invalid regiment. And after the war, when the couple was together, the wife's necklace was a material parallel to her husband's missing leg. This necklace linked his wounded body and hers, each and both together, providing material reminder of revolution. Symbol of a soldier and his wife intermingled, they provided together the necklace ball, a musket ball necklace and um, the missing leg, the couple's common sacrifice in the Patriot cause. Now, little over a decade after Arnold crafted her musket ball necklace, the war was over and independence was won, but private homes continued to contain objects that commemorated revolutionary military history. These included wallpaper, such as this, known as 4 July 1776, which appeared in a number of private homes in Philadelphia and New England. Produced between 1785 and 1790 by an American unknown manufacturer, 4 July 1776 had allegorical figures posed in the classical pillar and arch frame design style recommended for use in hallways. In it, America is the familiar feminine trope of Indian princess, and she stands next to the masculine figure of France, who wears a sword and a cockade and tramples British law underfoot while handing a copy of the Declaration of Independence to Britannia, really, I'm sorry for this, um, <laughs> who weeps over a memorial urn, symbolizing the loss of her child, America. Through using allegorical figures repetitively um, that were seen during the war itself, the wallpaper's aesthetics 
both called back to that war, but also already showed a new trend towards an aesthetic of neoclassicism that would characterize the early republic and encompass, among other things, the figure of America's Indian princess morphing into that of a neoclassical Lady of Liberty or Columbia. During the war itself, Americans like Arnold brought objects into their home that were often handcrafted or homespun, personal idiosyncratic gestures that recognized the role of violence in crafting revolution. As war ended and the business of building a republic commenced, the objects Americans used to um, remember the revolution changed. In the early republic, the goods that, com that um, commemorated the war were much more likely to be purchased, such as this one, rather than individually crafted or homespun, commercially made goods that celebrated a war that was largely devoid of rather than celebrated for its violence. Now these things, and their changes over time, and I'm sorry I don't have an image of the necklace which seems to be lost, but if you can picture this musket ball made into small beads in a necklace, I think you get a sense of its, its general um, material impact. These things and their change over time embody how American patriots and citizens during and after the revolution used material culture to domesticate revolution. Americans used things first to wage and then to come to terms with waging the war. Now today I'm going to deliberately tease out the many meanings of the word of um, domesticate to argue that Americans made and used object to domesticate the war in multiple senses. To bring battle into the home and home into, the ba into battle during the war itself. To make something public and communal, private and intimate. To create an American political culture to produce and consume goods related to the revolution in the American marketplace, and finally, to tame memories of a violent patriot past. Now, focusing on such evidence brings together fields that historians often treat separately, notably military and women's history. And I think that tearing down these tidy scholarly boundaries um, more properly echoes the actual emotional quotidian reality of men, women, and children who lived through the revolution and its aftermath. Such evidence illuminates ways in which women and children at home and men in battle and families together after the war together created shared revolutionary practices and histories. Material culture expressed and memorialized the shared devotion of men and women as well as children to the military history of the American patriot cause. And these things offer a really visceral way to understand the production of revolution, from Arnold's necklace made out of a musket ball to the wallpaper you see here. These are objects that embodied how Americans domesticated their revolution in every sense of the word. More specifically, objects also illuminate the gendered politics at play in domesticating the American Revolution. As makers of wartime homespun and consumers of post-war manufactured goods, as mothers of the generation that, quote, inherited the revolution, and as keepers of domestic spaces, women were key players in any history of the republic, of the politics embedded within buying, making, and using revolutionary and early republican material culture in domestic spaces. And things, then, offer new ways to understand the gender implications, first of patriot civilians' militant embrace of the revolutionary cause, and then of Americans' post-war obscuring of violence um, perpetrated by, and to a lesser extent, against patriots. Examination of these histories reveals the role things played during the, the war as embodiment and expression of militancy by women and children. After the war, things became vehicles for taming this militancy, aesthetic and spatial ways of encouraging Republican motherhood and healing the trauma American citizens bore from living through the violence of war. Now, scholar Alfred Young has eloquently argued that urges to domesticate the memory of revolutionary events, such as the Boston Tea Party, were motivated by labor politics and attempts at class control. Similarly, scholars such as Linda Kerber, Mary Beth Norton, and Rosemary Zagari have argued compellingly about how the ideal of Republican motherhood, the idea that women could best fulfill their role in a, uh, a body politic by raising virtuous Republican sons, um, domesticated women's multifaceted in the roles in the revolution um, by obscuring their militancy and folding them into um, a maternal framework that soothed early Republican fears about gendered politics. And finally, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich has shown that the collective memory of revolutionary homespun production and women's militancy in the war itself along with it has also been sanitized and feminized um, and that this began in the 19th century. <laughs>
It was no coincidence, I will add to this scholarship, that as the ideal of Republican motherhood encouraged American women to channel their politics into a safely domestic pursuit, the material culture of domestic spaces celebrated a radically tamed revolution. And here I'd like to point out the parallels here. Um, on the left you will see Lady Liberty as represented in 1779 um, in a uh, broadside published in New York. And on the right you will see a, familiar a much more familiar figure to most of you, which is Edward Savage's 1796 representation of Lady Liberty. And I'd just like to point out these are less than 20 years apart, and yet the aesthetic um, and the aesthetic and militant representation of these two figures could not be more radically different. And in fact, what I'm tracing today is how we get from the left to the right. And I argue that material culture plays a great role in this. So using Arnold's 1778 musket ball necklace and the 4th July 1776 wallpaper um, hung little more than a decade later as material and chronological boundaries, this talk today will consider material culture as both vehicle for and embodiment of domesticating revolution. I'm going to focus in particular on the gendered implications that the multiple meanings of the word domesticate hold and use object-based case studies to trace developments across regions. I promise I'm done with the historiography pretty much, but it was important to put it out there. So zooming in first on wartime material culture, I'll begin with a look at how dead soldiers were memorialized in domestic spaces in New England. I then move south to Maryland and North Carolina. And there I focus on teenagers' transformations of familiar childhood objects, um, in this case decorated eggs and mathematical exercise books, um, to provide evidence of the same domesticated militancy that is found in New England. Um, the wartime material culture analysis will end in the mid-Atlantic, where production of military-themed textiles allow for a fresh look at the politics of homespun. I promise you it's possible to come up with a fresh look at the politics <laughs> of homespun. Um, shifting to post-war material culture, finally, I will conclude by considering how revolutionary era material culture contributed to the domestication of revolution by looking primarily at objects, in this case imported British, Twall fabric and American made wallpaper um, whose consumption and use cut across all of these regions. So, to start with Sarah Arnold, her musket ball necklace at first might appear to be a very idiosyncratic oddity, but this object is actually not as irregular as it might first seem. Nor was the shared practice of salvage production and display between husband and wife that was um, embodied in this necklace unusual either. Captain Arnold sent home a reminder of the violence of battle, and his wife creatively transformed it into something that enshrined that memory in a decorative fashion. Now, the Arnolds were not the only Americans to willingly bring physical reminders of military conflict into their homes. Um, battlefront and homefront were intimately intertwined during the American Revolution. And while families like the Arnolds willingly brought reminders of battle into the home, others brought reminders of home into battle. And the most obvious example of this is ordinary soldiers who carved images of homes um, onto their, their powder horns. Similarly, Martha Washington regularly wintered with her husband, the commander-in-chief, at his military um, headquarters and infused the Continental Army um, headquarters with an air of domesticity that the American and French officers uniformly commented upon as being a very welcome thing. Um, and I think George slept in a very different bed when Martha was there. And if you've seen his camp bed, you understand why he felt a welcome change in the, the ur urge of a domesticity. Um, after the war, in the late 1780s, as Americans negotiated how to form a new national political culture, they continued to decorate their bodies and their homes with reminders of the revolution. But the war they remembered after the revolution was often markedly different um, from the one that they commemorated as battles were ongoing. During the revolution itself, patriots, who are the focus of this talk, and an interesting um, side question to this project is whether loyalists are doing the same thing. I think that they probably are, and I have some evidence for that. But unfortunately, the loyalists did not win the war. I will say unfortunately because I'm in Britain. Um, and actually, I kind of agree with the loyalists on a lot of levels. But they did not win the war. And what I'm interested here today is how the victors then switched the narrative drastically that they had been telling in the war to this sort of um, very strangely bloodless revolution that they remembered. So patriots are the focus of this talk, and throughout the war they made, bought, and used material culture to galvanize political support, inspire protest, and manage the violent experience of war. Now objects and images provided evocative ways to tell a story. They could spread news while influencing Americans of all ages, sexes, and uh, levels of literacy to uh, practice war and align politics in a certain way. 
And much scholarly attention has been paid to how colonial Americans did exactly this in public spaces, in the politics of the street. But far less attention has been paid to how Americans venerated the, re the revolution in private spaces, for example, in the warm comfort of their beds rather than out on the streets. And today I'm going to seek to illuminate how the revolution played out in exactly the, such private spaces, such as beds. Um, although I should say, disclaimer, nothing salaciously interesting will be shared today. It's more about the furnishings of the beds. Um, things that celebrated or commemorated battles could connect private homes to public battlegrounds in a number of ways. When touched by hands, slept under, held in laps, worn on bodies, or used and displayed in homes, things such as a musket ball necklace or a print showing a battle scene could widen the impact of military experiences beyond the men who were actually there, or the women in some cases. None of Thomas and Sarah Arnold's six children, for example, fought in the Battle of Monmouth, but when they saw or touched their mother's musket ball necklace, they would have thought of the war as surely as when they saw their father's missing leg. Their mother's necklace might have evoked all sorts of, um, or number of coinciding emotions, from sadness at their father's amputated limb, to pride in his service, from patriotic fervor to hatred and anger for the British and loyalist troops who fought in the revolution, Objects by their nature, in other words, are visceral, physical vessels, able to uh, stir imagination and emotion, as well as memory. And eliciting such shared emotional response, whether that be anger, fear, sadness, triumph, or happiness, was of course crucial to inspiring and um, maintaining cultures of revolution. And objects did another thing, too. They allowed citizens from New England to South Carolina um, to have tangible ways to participate in a shared imagined community. And they offer another way, another, another way, in other words, to understand the production of revolution. So these shared emotional experiences become clear if we put Arnold's musket ball necklace into its larger material context. Um, and I'll just show one example here. Most revolutionary era necklaces, I don't think I need to tell you, were not made of bullets or musket balls. Um, but Arnold's necklace was reminiscent of a number of things that Americans kept in their home notably used bullets, and this is one that a family kept in their home um, during the Revolution and after. Um, these bullets brought memories of battle into the home, were usually kept in public places of display, um, and many were linked to histories of how armed war affected American homes. Um, some were retrieved because they entered houses during conflicts or had histories that linked them in viewers' minds to the domestic settings in which the people who had them injected into their limbs um, had experienced the violence. Um, and in this case, the bullet that you see on the right was one that was um, come through the door of a house along the route to um, uh, the Boston Massacre, and it, it embedded itself in a man's arm. Um, and so the man's arm, not amputated in this case, but wounded, the bullet was taken out and it was kept by his family as a memory of, of what happened. So in other words, Arnold's necklace, um, like this used artillery, became mementos of military violence that were willingly um, enshrined in the home. And there they reminded viewers of pivotal events while also memorializing the damage revolutionary conflict did to flesh and to houses alike. The Arnold necklace also functioned much like other much more ordinary and familiar objects that brought reminders of revolutionary battles into the home. Most common and familiar among such objects, of course, were prints, like Revere's Boston Massacre print, or Amos Doolittle's print of the Battle of Lexington and Concord, which you see here. Prints could be experienced and viewed in many different ways. They could be seen at a slight distance, hung framed on the wall, or viewed more intimately, held in one's hand or lap when printed in books and almanacs. Um, and I think it's important to point out here that women obviously bought and used such prints um, and owned such publications. So prints are another way to understand how women and men together are using the same material culture. Like Arnold's necklace, prints also brought the battlefield into the home and the civilian gaze of those like women and children who were not physically present at the battle. Um, and I want to point out one thing before I move on from this print, which is um, the central structure you see there, which is a very famous tavern, which becomes important later in this tale. So revolutionary era printmakers, such as Amos Doolittle, intentionally politicized their work at times, obviously. They also at times intended prints to serve as a tangible reminder of military violence in the home, where women and children could witness the after effects of what occurred. Now one such broadside, which is much less familiar than Doolittle's famous print, was something called the bloody butchery by the British troops of the uh, runaway fight of the regulars. So here you see um, bloody butchery, 
And in case you don't get the point, it is starkly illustrated with 40 black coffins, familiar icons of death, um, above its title, meant to be a reminder of the patriots who were slain during this conflict by the bloody butchery of the British. So most of this print, other than the coffins, um, is actually a very long, very historically inaccurate, but bloodily detailed account of the atrocities that the British committed against the, um, against the Americans. Now, it also, though, at the bottom includes a very revealing note after this history. It notes that, quote, these particulars are published in this cheap form, this is on very cheap, flimsy paper, as it was desired that, quote, every householder in the country who are sincere well-wishers to America may be possessed of the same, either to frame and glass or otherwise preserve in their houses as a perpetual memorial of this important event. In other words, the makers of this cheap broadside made explicit their intent that the print should be put in frames under glass or otherwise preserved for display on the walls of homes. As it was cheap, it was something that could be hung on the walls of more impoverished as well as elite people. And it brought the bloody experiences of men on the battlefield into the home where women, children, and men not physically there could learn about, discuss, remember, and imagine these battles. And in this case, it's obviously propaganda because it's not even an accurate description of what happened. Objects that made violence decorative, this is something that um, could be a material mechanism for encouraging a shared political reaction to the violence that it described. Now, New Englander Abigail Adams, I'm sure a name that is known to you all, was the type of consumer who would have appreciated the virtues of placing a print like Bloody Butchery within her home. Adams herself took steps to memorialize violent battles in her children's minds. As her son John Quincy later recalled, when he was only in the eighth year of his age, she took him to view the Battle of Bunker Hill. Seventy years later, Adams still vividly recalled seeing the battle as a child. He remembered how, quote, I saw with my own eyes um, those fires and heard Britannia's thunders while he witnessed the tears of my mother and mingled those with my own. So Abigail Adams continued to reinforce the memory of this battle that she forced her son to see in the family home. Um, as a way of remembering the Patriot deaths in the Battle of Bunker Hill, she added a daily ritual to John Quincy's morning routine. After reciting the Lord's Prayer, before rising from his bed, he recalled he had to recite a poem. Now the poem that he had to recite was William Collins' Ode, written in the year 1746, on the Patriot warriors of Britain who fell in the war to subdue the Jacobites in the uh, Rebellion of 1745. Now this seems a little strange, right? Um, I have to say as a mother, I don't think I would take my child to see a battle, and I don't think I would ask him to commemorate it by reciting a poem to the dead every morning afterwards. But I think it's important to dwell on this because I think it tells you a lot of important things about the mentality of patriots trying to get their children as well as themselves um, on board with the, with the violence um, and the militancy that was necessary to successfully um, fight the revolution. So Abigail Adams associated this poem in particular with the death of one of their dear friends, a famous patriot, Dr. Joseph Warren, at Bunker Hill. As she wrote woefully to her husband John in this letter I've cited here today, thinking of Warren's death, quote, made these favorite lines of the Collins poem continually sound in my ears. And you can see here the lines that um, she wrote in the poem. How sleep the brave who sink to rest by all their country's wishes blessed, when spring with dewy fingers cold return to deck their hallowed mold. Sh she there sh shall dress a sweeter sod than fancy's feet has ever trod. By fairy hands their knell is rung, by forms unseen their dirge is sung. Their honor comes a pilgrim gray to bless the turf that wraps their clay. And freedom shall a while repair to dwell a weeping hermit there. Now these lines that Abigail Adam wrote to her husband um, about her sadness at Warren's death obviously are discussing the moldering bodies of fallen soldiers um, in the earth. It's a pretty visceral um, account of, of their fate. They also happen to be the very same that she had her son, her eight-year-old son, recite in bed every morning this summer following the battle. John Quincy Adams remembered the words 70 years later, recording them in an 1846 letter word for word just as his mother penned them here in 1775. Abigail Adams successfully then perpetuated the memory of Warren's death in the Battle of Bunker Hill for her child, but by insisting that he remember the violence of military conflict in, co conflict in the comforting space of his bed, she domesticated it too. Um, and I think this maybe explains a lot about John Quincy Adams for uh, <laughs> any of you who have spent any time thinking about him as a man and a president. But I think more importantly, 
think of this young child sitting in his bed, reciting the Lord's Prayer, and then reciting these um, lines of a poem about dead soldiers' bodies moldering in the clay. Um, and I think it gives you the idea of uh, how you might feel differently about your home um, and the remembrance of violence after you had this experience that you vividly recall 70 years later. So not everyone, of course, is made of the same stern stuff as the Adams family, but what I'd like to suggest is that this is not actually so strange. Because while young John Quincy Adams remembered the Battle of Bunker Hill every morning in his bed in Massachusetts, another young man further south also thought about the battle. But this Maryland boy left evidence of his thoughts um, through what he did to an egg, which he decorated with an engraving of the Battle of Bunker's Hill. Now in doing so, he followed local customs, a boiling eggs in logwood, which dyed the shell crimson or black, and then using a, a pin to scratch figures on them, um, a practice common, as the observer noted, among young men and maidens to present them to each other as love tokens. Now, again, I don't have an image of the egg itself, but you can get an idea of what logwood, the color of logwood, by the eggs on the right, and the sort of style of egg decoration from these... Um, these eggs collected by Winterture, which are from the 1850s, um, on the top left. Um, and so picture an egg, but with an image of a battle on it, and you get an idea of what was going on here. Now this boy, who decorated the egg with the Battle of Bunker Hill, was the son of the owner of a plantation near Fredericktown in Maryland, and the family were patriots. Um, we have a record of this egg from a British officer who stayed on it um, as a prisoner of war near the end of the war. The boy's father, Colonel Beatty, used the egg as an educational tool, according to the officer. He took, quote, infinite pains to explain the egg scene to his children, his other children, describing it as one in which, quote, considering the small space, delineated the battle very well. Um, now, Colonel Beatty did this, uh, according to the officer, to impress the minds of his children with their glorious struggle for independence, as they term it. Now, one senses that the Patriot Colonel also used the egg to impress the mind of the British officer observing the scene. However, although he showed it to them, the Patriot soldier would, quote, not suffer anyone to touch it, being the performance of his son gone to camp, but now being slain, he preserves it as a relic. So the boy, in other words, also enlisted for the Patriots and died in the course of the revolution. So if the boy had created this patriotic object intending, as young men often did, to give it to a sweetheart, he might well have found a girl who appreciated its military imagery as well as its romantic gesture. And this is because Southern girls, like boys, created objects and images that celebrated the military history of the Revolution. Two girls' mathematical exercise books offer proof of their militancy. In Albemarle Sound, North Carolina, a 16-year-old girl named Margaret or Peggy Clayton kept a mathematical exercise book in 1776. And this might be familiar to a lot of you from Winterthur. It's in the collection there. Now, Clayton's math book was a typical type thing. It was the type of exercise that tutors prescribed for teaching young ladies the skills that they would need to manage plantation economies for existence, um, for instance, that were involved in transatlantic trade. But Clayton used this space for more than practicing her math skills. Um, she also used it to record her support of the revolutionary cause. And placed among the math exercises are elaborate drawings of flags, ships, troops, poems, and descriptions of recent military events. Um, among the things she describes are the death of General Montgomery in Quebec, the Battle of Moores Creek Bridge, and the burning of Norfolk, Virginia by Virginia's last royal governor, Lord Dunmore. Now Clayton had a habit of punctuating her images and descriptions of events with rather ferociously patriotic opinions. And no one drew her ire quite like the aforementioned Lord Dunmore, um, whom on one page marking her new efforts at division, you can see <laughs> she used to describe um, the, the burning of Norfolk using the D in division to start Dunmore's name. And she had decided views on how history should judge Dunmore. She wrote, quote, in utter devastation, let the wicked tyrant Dunmore's name be handed down to the latest posterity by every will wishers to liberty. Now she also called him the Grand Negro Chief. And this is an important point to bring out because like many Southerners, Clayton, self-avowed well-wisher to liberty though she was, seemed to find no irony at all in the fact that she found Dunmore reprehensible because of his 1775 proclamation, offering freedom to people enslaved by American rebels who were willing to join the British forces that would in turn give them their liberty. Um, obviously unaware of this irony or unwilling to countenance it, no, Clayton nevertheless repeatedly wrote the phrase liberty or death in her book. Um, where it can be found on flags emblazoned with the slogan near drawings of houses, flowers, and ships. 
And similarly, around 1781, another North Carolina girl, Martha Ryan, um, made a very similar book in which she too embraced that phrase over and over again. Um, and here you see the title page, emblazoned liberty or death beneath the owner's name. Um, Ryan, like Clayton, embraced this militant slogan, which was a popular one to be sure, but one more usually discussed in the context of men than women. Um, and since I know that uh, British uh, educational systems don't necessarily provide you all the details of the American Revolution. I will pause and point out that this phrase comes from um, March 1775 when Patrick Henry famously ended a rousing speech to the Second Virginia Convention with the memorable call to give me liberty or give me death. Um, this phrase was taken up in a variety of um, fashion by various men around America. Virginia Minutemen from um, Culpeper County, uh, allegedly wore strong brown hunting shirts that were dyed in leaves and the words liberty or death worked or embroidered in large white letters on the breast. Um, at least some, no doubt, sewn by women. So in sum, from Patrick Henry's famous exhortation of it to the reported embroidery on the hunting shirts that Virginia Minutemen wore into battle, um, and you can also see it etched onto um, other decorative objects made for men, such as this pewter mug, which was engraved for um, a Pennsylvania Patriot captain um, to celebrate his service, also reads liberty or death. Um, it's a phrase more commonly associated with militantly um, minded men than with young girls. But the undeniable presence of the phrase in Clayton's and Ma Ryan's math books um, reminds us, I think, that those at home and those on the battlefield, in fact, embrace the same militant ideologies, that they express these intertwined ideological worlds in their material world, too. And in Ryan's case, the interconnections between militancy and home were further emphasized by the visual presence of houses that she had above the phrase, which you can see there. But Martha Ryan's book expressed its patriotism in its materiality as well as its aesthetics and its patriotic expressions for it's covered with homespun. And you can see her initials on top of the homespun in the top middle there. Now during the revolution, of course, homespun became a proud symbol of American defiance of British taxation policies. Men and women alike expressed their patriotism through making and wearing homespun, but the production of homespun, both during the revolution and in the subsequent memory of it, was always more firmly linked to women and traditional domestic labor than to men. So it would not be at all surprising if Ryan helped to make the homespun fabric that covered her cipher book as a patriotic act in of itself. Um, even if she did not make it herself, as I should point out might well have been the case for a North Carolina girl with enslaved laborers who could make the cloth instead, the political symbolism of it, whether she made it or not, um, as a fitting cover to house her vehement patriotic sentiments would not have escaped her. Now the full political connotations of homespun can be grasped only by remembering that in America, Homespun did not necessarily denote coarse or low quality fabric. On the contrary, it might refer to high quality fabric that was simply made in America with domestic production implying made in America or homespun rather than produced actually in a private home. One such piece of revolutionary homespun was also one of the absolute earliest images ever produced of George Washington, um, which you see here. And it was based on the first print made of his image. Now the story behind its commission and production, um, as well as its intended use and targeted consumers, I think sheds further light on the intertwined nature of the military and the domestic and revolutionary political culture. Um, this was made between 1776 and 1777, when a professional calico printer in Philadelphia placed a portrait of Washington on a handkerchief. And I think it's worth noting um, that in, in engaging in this um, type of production, calico production, this printer was doing something that had been illegal under British imperial policy before this. So the simple act of him setting up a calico printing shop is defiant in of itself. And in fact, when the British occupied Philadelphia, they destroyed his shop. And that's not coincidental. Um, so this handkerchief um, is something that makes a bold visual statement. It's about 30 by 33 inches. Um, and this is a good reminder, I think, that as many of you probably know, 18th century handkerchiefs did not simply serve the nose-blowing purpose um, that we think of them today. Instead, they might be used much like a print um, or as a map or to chronicle information about important people or historical events. Um, they also could often serve as centerpieces for quilted bed covers. And um, this one, in particular, obviously has a patriotic message. In its center, we see George Washington posed in military uniform with a drawn sword astride a horse. And he's encircled by text that dubs him foundator and protester of America's liberty and independency. 
And around the edges um, of the circle, you have vine and floral motifs surrounding military equipment like flags, cannonballs, and cannon. And I think it's very interesting that like Peggy Clayton's mathematical exercise book, um, I think you can see the very similar visual aesthetic that's going on here, the combination of floral and military martial iconography. So both of these bring military imagery couched in a decorative aesthetic into the gaze and touch of women and children at home. Now, especially when made into a quilted coverlet, as this particular kerchief shows evidence of having been the centerpiece of, it functioned much like John Quincy Adams' daily recitation in remembrance of soldiers' deaths and their moldering bodies in the Battle of Bunker Hill. Like Adams' morning poetry recitation, this quilt imbued one of a home's most intimate and theoretically comforting spaces, the bed, and those sleeping in it or under the quilt, in this case, with a constant reminder of revolutionary military history. Now, the story of the kerchief's production is one of cross-gender collaboration. And I say story because it's not verifiable, but work with me because I think it still has a point, even if it's not true. <laughs> I will explain that. The calico printer who made this copied the figure of George Washington from one of the earliest engravings done of him, a British rendering of him, um, after Alexander Campbell's depiction. And I think it's obvious to any of you who can picture George Washington that Campbell clearly has never seen the man. This is not an accurate depiction of George Washington. Um, but this was the first, uh, the first rendering of him outside of of an earlier portrait that never made it out of, the, out of America. Um, so this is important for that reason alone. This is how British people pictured George Washington at the outset of the imperial conflict that led to revolution. So what's interesting about this as well is that Martha Washington undeniably owned a copy of this Campbell print. And in the 1840s, a daughter of the Germantown calico printer um, who'd set up shop in Philadelphia, John Hewson, recalled how Martha Washington visited her father's shop in 1775 and inquired of him whether a representation of the general on horseback could be so made as to occupy the center of a handkerchief. Now, like many 19th century anecdotes about pretty much anything, much less Martha Washington, this one is, is otherwise uncorroborated. But it's possible the story is true um, for a couple of reasons. Martha Washington owned the print. She was physically in Philadelphia at the time. And the Washingtons actually played themselves with setting up calico production at Mount Vernon. And so interest, motive, you know, the historical detective in me says there's interest, there's motive, there's opportunity. It all, you know, it's plausible, right? Um, so it's possible the story's true. But I'd like to suggest that in some ways, its veracity is almost beside the point. Because regardless of the truth behind Martha Washington commissioning the kerchief from Houston, her being linked to the story of its creation invites us to think more carefully about the important yet somewhat unacknowledged role women in general, and Martha Washington in particular, played in the creation of popular revolutionary political culture through their making, buying, and using of material culture. As wife to the American commander-in-chief, Martha Washington obviously was domestic foil to her husband's military presence and body. And together, the Washingtons presented a popular image that reinforced the culture of domesticating revolution. The couple, whether physically together at military winter headquarters or visually together when their images hung side by side on American walls, embodied simultaneous reminders of home and battle. And I think it's very interesting that during the revolution itself, um, companion portraits of George and Martha Washington are very popular items. Um, to give you one example, John Adams, oh, there you can see the, the original print next to the, the kerchief. You can see it's a pretty faithful representation of the print. John Hancock commissioned Charles Wilson Peale to um, paint companion portraits of the two. George Washington's is on the right. Martha Washington's does not, the whereabouts are unknown. But it would have looked similarly to that, which is, um, which is a, uh, a copy of a print um, by Joseph Heller. And they had a number of different iterations. You can see here another example of them being made into prints. And then further, and this is one of my favorite things in the painting collection at Winterthur, these rather magnificently terrible um, <laughs> paintings of, of the two based on the prints um, by a painter who so, sort of has a Germanic folk style. Um, we don't know who he is for sure, though. In other words, these things were popular. They were replicated over and over again in different, in different formats and in different regions. Um, and Americans hung these things on their walls, much as they had once hung prints of British kings and queens. And if George, as was so often suggested, was the bodily replacement of the king, then Martha stood in for the queen. And what their dual portraits did, as much as announced shifts in political loyalties and leaders, 
was to also visually emphasize the role of women, of this woman in particular, as a key player in the creation of a new political culture. Now, during the war, Martha Washington was made the symbolic figurehead of a well-known project that provides evidence of other patriot women's militant enthusiasm for supporting the war and its soldiers. And this was something that's become known since as the Ladies' Association, um, although it was pointed out to me by another historian recently that that also seems to be a 19th century invention, which is interesting. And this was the collective effort that was launched by Esther de Beard Reed, um, whom you see at the top left, uh, who was the wife of Adjutant General of the Army, Joseph Reed, and Benjamin Franklin's daughter, Sally Franklin Bache, whom you see in the middle there in 1780. Now, to announce this effort, Reed published a broadside, which you see there. Um, it was published by John Dunlap, who was the official printer to the Continental Congress and the first printer of the first printed copy of the Declaration of Independence. In other words, she, she went bold with her printing choice. Um, and as she wrote in this broadside, Sentiments of an American Woman, the association was meant to be a fundraising campaign launched to thank what she called the Valiant Defenders of America. And what's really fascinating about this is that this fundraising campaign by these women actually raised more money than any effort by American merchants um, throughout the war. They raised over $300,000. Um, apparently, they sometimes did it by chasing um, Quaker old men down the street who didn't want to give them money, but they did it <laughs> nevertheless. And I think that that's a really interesting um, point to make, is that these women were highly successful at this fundraising effort. Now, in this, this broadside, she set out the ideals of the association as well as the logistical ideas for carrying it through. And in this, she echoed familiar rhetoric about virtuous self-sacrifice and homespun, and she asked women to show their gratitude to the Continental Army by curbing their buying habits, by wearing what she called clothing more simple and hair dressed less elegant, and donating what they might have spent on said clothing or hair towards a monetary bonus for Continental Army soldiers instead. She called upon American women near the end of the broadside to return to what she called an earlier time when our Republican and laborious hands spun the flax. And funds raised from the women's efforts were ultimately to be handed over to Martha Washington, who was to present them to the commander in chief. And I should note this became a, um, a cross state effort as well. In Virginia, Martha Jefferson was the designated collector of, of, the, uh, of the monies. Um, Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, all of these places successfully raised money. Once this money was collected, however, and it was forwarded to George Washington, Esther Reed and George Washington argued about what was to be done with it. Washington um, came right out and said he feared his soldiers would spend it on drink, and he suggested instead that the Ladies' Association should make his men shirts, um, a request that was expressly, by the way, against the women's stated um, desire in the broad side not to use the money they raised to provide anything that the Congress was obliged to provide for the Army, including very particularly clothing. However, after some protest, Reed complied, and the Ladies' Association made shirts for Washington's army. And I often think this must have been rather devastating for Reed because she named her child, who was born around this time, George Washington Reed. And to have this sort of smackdown from the man she named her child after at the same time, I think, must have been rather devastating. Um, she died before the project could be completed, but the project went forward. And in fact, the Ladies' Association made thousands of shirt, shirts. A visitor to Sally Franklin Bache described seeing in her home, quote, a room filled with needlework, recently finished by the ladies of Philadelphia, which consisted of shirts for the soldiers of Pennsylvania, with each shirt embroidered with the name of the married or unmarried lady who made it, and there were 2,200 shirts in all. Now, despite the very real need for shirts, Lafayette, who'd come to Philadelphia um, earlier, had commented that the army looked naked to him. Um, as scholars have pointed out, Washington's insistence that the Ladies' Association sew rather than turn over the cash that they had raised channeled the women's political efforts into a safely feminine, suitably domestic activity of sewing. But although the history of the association in this way does seem to foreshadow the dominance of Republican motherhood in American political culture, the Ladies' Association also speaks to how women actively contributed to a wartime culture of militant revolutionary fervor. And I think this becomes evident when you don't look at just the ending bit about the homespun and the broadside, but the full text, particularly the starting bits. And when you look at and think about these shirts themselves as material things that sent a message. It's evident that this is much more than simply another example of women's politics being pigeonholed <coughs> into what was seen as an appropriate domestic sphere. Instead, this movement in these shirts provide another example of how Americans, 
in this case women, used objects to bring battle into home, home into battle, and how women used and made visual and material culture to express their militant revolutionary politics. Now, Reed's broadside is generally discussed as engaging this homespun Republican ideal. Um, but what's rarely mentioned is its opening, or the historical women she holds up as figures for American women to emulate. She starts with the Old Testament. She talks about Judith. She talks about Esther. If you know your biblical history, you know these are women who quite literally had men decapitated. Um, she talks about Roman women arming battlements. <coughs> she talks about Joan of Arc as an ideal leader to look up to during the American Revolution. Her call to contribute to the military is, in other words, much more militant than it is feminine. And she holds up militant female figures as icons that American patriot women should embrace. And similarly, the shirts themselves bear more consideration than they're generally given. Um, they were undoubtedly homespun. Um, they were sewn and embroidered by American women at home for use by the Continental Army. So they were homespun in every sense of the word. But since they were embroidered with the names of the women who made them, they also served as connectors. They connected the bodies of men on the battlefield who wore them with those of individual women at home, in much the same way that Sarah Arnold's musket ball necklace connected her body to that of her wounded husband. They put the symbolic act of female protest embodied in homespun into a military context, using needle, fabric, and thread to announce their maker's militant politics, to literally put their name to their militancy. Each shirt's signature asserted a woman's ownership over it, much like a soldier's name carved into a powder horn. They memorialized both the military service of the soldier who wore it and the labor of the woman at home who sewed it for him. These shirts carried the names of their female makers into battle on the bodies of the thousands of soldiers who wore them, talismans to remind soldiers at home. Um, and I think I don't need to explain to you that why many of these, I don't know of any, that survive. Um, these are fragile things and they went into battle. Um, but it's worthwhile, I think, to think of what the men must have felt when they got this shirt and saw the woman's name embroidered on it. So once soldiers returned home, those soldiers who did return home, men and women together continued to craft things that expressed their intertwined militant patriotism. But it almost immediately starts to be tampered down. Um, and one of my very favorite material objects to talk about um, are these little shoes. Um, these little shoes, and I used this picture so you could see the scale of them, obviously made for an infant. Um, they are made out of cloth that is taken from a British red coat um, that was captured in battle by a Patriot soldier. They were made in 1784, um, and they were worn by generations of this family um, as a sort of sit on grandpa's knee and grandma's knee and hear about the revolutionary past that your forebears experienced. And what I find really fascinating about these is that they are obviously not negating violence. Um, they are made out of a military uniform. Um, they were captured by someone who served in the military, um, whose three brothers, incidentally, were killed in the war as well. So I think that they probably were an object that were laden with grief and regret, as well as with triumph. Um, but the fact that they're channeled into an item of clothing, a soft item of clothing for a baby's soft, tender feet, I think tells a lot about how the violence is being channeled almost immediately after the revolution into something that is more manageable, that is, that is more able to negotiate the trauma of, of fighting the war. And after the war, Americans not only had to negotiate post-war trauma, they also had to negotiate how to form a new national political culture. And those of you who know your early American history know this was hardly uncontested. Um, Infighting broke out almost immediately. But Americans continued to domesticate the revolution by buying and hanging things that reminded them of it. Um, they hung revolutionary themed prints, paintings, and wallpaper in their homes, and they used things like ceramics, often bought from England, that celebrated military icons like Washington. But the aesthetic of the things changed, and here I think the aesthetics are very important. As they had during the war, one of the most domestic and intimate of spaces, the bed, often served as a site for reinforcing political allegiance and celebrating military history. Just as during the war itself, the bed of young John Quincy Adams became a site of visceral remembrance of the Battle of Bunker Hill, an intimate domestic space that also served as a place of sacralized daily attention to death and battle. After the war, beds continued to be places where military history was celebrated. And one of my favorite of these um, is something that will be familiar to the winter true folk. Um, in 1785, young Tommy Shippen of Philadelphia stayed in the New York City home of his uncle, Richard Henry Lee, who was then a member of Congress. Like John Quincy Adams, Shippen's bed um, became a memorial to revolutionary hero heroes generally in the Battle of Bunker Hill in particular. 
And in this case, his in-bed memories of the battle would have been jogged not by poetry, but rather by the textiles that festooned it as curtains. And this is a reproduction that was done of um, what it would have appeared like. As you can see, the textiles are front and center, hard to avoid them. What they are is yard upon yard of cotton and linen printed in the botanical patterns typical of toile, um, made in Britain, enlivened by an elaborate design of military and revolutionary iconography that surrounded him while he lay in bed. And I'll let him describe it. Quote, my chamber is prettily furnished. Which way soever I turn my eyes, I find a triumphal car, a liberty cap, a temple of fame, or the hero of heroes, all these and many more objects of a piece with them, being finely represented upon the hangings. By hero of heroes, of course, he meant George Washington, copy from a Trumbull painting here, um, who's found on the fabric in his military uniform, in a chariot with the allegorical figure of America, with familiar feather plumes in her hair, and a plaque inscribed American Independence, 1776. Um, and if you look behind Washington, that hill is a very classic representation of the Battle of Bunker Hill. So in other words, both before and both during and after the war, young men um, in New England and in New York found their beds were more than furniture for resting. They were sites of patriotic remembrance of military history, places where they quite literally woke up remembering the Battle of Bunker Hill. Now, Shippens was not a limited experience. Um, the apotheosis of Washington and Franklin, as it's um, popularly called, Benjamin Franklin was in there too. I don't have an image of him though. Um, he would be very upset by that. Um, it, was very, it was very popular, um, as attested to by the fact that its manufacturers produced it in more than one color. Um, lots of it, relatively lots of it survive. Um, and although only three 18th century American owners have been identified with certainty, I think it's interesting that all three were linked to um, politics or military service, including um, Continental Army officers. Now, to get back to our final um, piece that I referenced at the beginning of the talk, another similarly popular post-war interior decoration with a military theme was this wallpaper, known as 4 July 1776. As I noted, this was produced between 1785 and 1790 by an unknown American manufacturer. Um, and it had allegorical figures posed in this classical pillar and arch frame, which was recommended for and popular for use in hallways, very public spaces in a home, in other words. In it, America, the Indian princess, as I noted, stands next to the masculine figure of France. They trample British law underfoot, and poor Britannia mourns to the left. Um, now, 18th century viewers would have readily un understood these figures and their allegorical meanings. Um, America as an Indian princess, of course, was one of the more familiar images used to represent America in the revolutionary era on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and she had appeared on everything from maps to porcelain um, from the 16th century on, but became particularly popular in the 1760s and 70s. Now, what's interesting to, about wallpaper is that little to no regional difference exists among it in terms of how it was made and used in early America, um, making it a valuable source about consumption across regional lines. Boston and Philadelphia were the centers of American post-revolutionary wallpaper production, but their products traveled throughout the early republic, with Boston products advertised as far afield as Baltimore and Philadelphia wallpapers available in Charleston. Wallpapers like 4 July 1776, in other words, were American manufacturers with national rather than regional patterns of consumption. And wallpaper was available for consumption at varied price points. Um, and although some wallpaper was admittedly very expensive, manufacturers also produced cheaper versions. And sometimes these really, really cheap versions, not this, but cheaper versions, were used um, to cover walls or finish edges, which was less expensive than paying the labor to um, plaster over them. And see, there was a connection to your earlier thing. Um, so wallpaper trade in the 1780s and 1790s um, was a way to understand a national, nationalized Republican discourse that emerged from the re revolutionary tradition of consumer boycotts and domestic production. American-made wallpaper like this one was <coughs> one of the products whose consumption was touted um, very widely by, um, by those who wanted to support America's nascent homespun manufacturers. So, in other words, hung on walls in a private home, this wallpaper, made by an American wallpaper manufacturer, could announce its owner's patriotism, much like a suit of homespun had during the revolution itself. And that was not just because of the images, but because of the fact that it was domestically produced. The images on the wallpaper told a story about revolutionary history. They inspired memory and conversation. And glued to the walls of one of the most public spaces of a house, as such wallpaper would have been, um, it made a committed and difficult to ignore political statement. And we have evidence that um, at least one of the people who hung this in their home signed up to buy John Trumbull's series of political prints, which weren't manifested. But 
those prints were um, the type of prints that were often hung in hallways themselves. And so if you can imagine, <coughs> this man envisioned this print, this wallpaper in his hallway with Jonathan Trumbull's series of Revolutionary War history on top of it. So I think the message he's trying to send with his interior decoration is pretty clear. Although, I will also point out, I say he because his is the name assigned to the subscription list, but let's all be clear, we know that women as well as men furnish these homes. And so I think this is a, an important reminder that although the men's names are what are popping up on these subscription lists, um, the, the missus at home was, was no doubt also involved in and committed to this visual display of, of patriotism. Now this wallpaper we know is popular because it's been found in multiple locations. Um, wallpaper I think is really fascinating because it's often scraped off or covered over. So much like the linen shirts worn into battle made by the Ladies Association, it's elusive historical evidence. And despite this, a home in Philadelphia, three private homes, and two taverns retain evidence of the wallpaper in New England, um, including Buckman Tavern in Massachusetts. And I mentioned to you to please remember that tavern. Um, and that was because after 1775, the tavern, which was the meeting site for the Patriot Militia who went out to um, battle in the Battle of Lexington and Concord, became famous as the site from which the shot heard round the world um, began. And 4 July 1776, as you see here in this reproduction, was sometimes printed um, in a buff and blue color combination that was deliberately meant to be reminiscent of Continental Army uniforms. So by the time its proprietors of the Buckman Tavern hung this wallpaper in this color um, scheme on the walls of their tavern, that tavern itself was already a military history icon, a space of sacred revolutionary memory given widespread visibility in prints like the Doolittle one I showed you that depicted it with its distinctive double chimneys in the Battle of Lexington. So like the Philadelphia hallway of the private home in which this wallpaper also hung, um, Buckman Tavern was an architectural space that used decorative arts to encompass visitors with revolutionary memory. You were quite literally surrounded by it. You couldn't escape visually the fact of the revolution. Now during the revolution itself, I think it's important to point out that um, public houses like Buckman's Tavern were themselves quasi-domestic spaces. They were places where people slept as well as ate and drank. And during the revolution, they also were where people gathered for political or military mobilization. So in other words, after the revolution, partly through its own history and its own architectural presence on the Tavern Green, and partly through this wallpaper, Buckman's would have served as an integrative political node, a place that materially communicated political culture in a comfortably quasi-domestic space. During and after the war, New Englanders who once saw America as an Indian princess illuminated outdoors um, or stood to watch men in Indian-type costumes dump tea into Boston Harbor installed that familiar figure on the walls of their domestic spaces, but in comfortably aestheticized ways. Allegorical figures and scenes that had appeared in cartoons, pamphlets, and engravings in the imperial crisis reappeared once the war was won in different forms as ephemeral images once meant to be passed around taverns or discussed in private homes, and material culture used in riots and rituals of the streets lived a nostalgic afterlife standing upright on domestic walls or festooned around and across beds. Women and children continued to use and view these images just as the men who participated in a mob protest had used them during the war itself. And I'd like to end by suggesting that if revolution relies upon repetition, upon mobilizing a critical mass of individual people to react in the same way and at the same time, inspiring them to respond to political events and revolutionary ideas. As scholars examine how American patriots built such a common cause across boundaries of class and space, how they excluded, shamed, and punished those who did not fight on their side, how they developed effective protest strategies and then mobilized to fight a war and establish a nation, that excavating the historical evidence of visual material culture related to bringing battle into the home helps us to better understand these processes. The visual communicates ideological messages, and the material can viscerally embody emotional experiences. An egg could represent a battle fought and a dead son. A musket ball could be sent home and stand in for a lost leg. Southern girls and women could embroider defiant slogans of liberty or death onto shirts and write them in books, just as men wore them into battle. Martha Washington's image hung on walls beside that of her commander-in-chief husband. And after the war, objects like wallpaper and textiles continued to imbue domestic spaces shared by women and children and men with reminders of their process of declaring independence and fighting the war. Now, despite the great differences in material and form of the objects and images I've covered today, I'd like to suggest that on one level, they're fundamentally alike. And in fact, I think their differing materiality is something that speaks to their collective power. 
because each and all together they were a communicative thing that provided ways to articulate the ideology, to fire the emotion, and to manage the practice of revolution and its remembrances. Each of these things, different though they were from one another, mediated ordinary people's experiences with military violence and revolutionary politics. They made patriotic sacrifice sacred, while also commemorating that the imaginative and physical worlds of men and women in the revolution were often more intertwined than they were separate spheres. And these things finally remind us how Americans used visual material culture to come to terms with military violence, how they chose, and I would say continue to choose, to domesticate the revolution. Thank you. several times um, that these objects would remind people of the traumatic violence of war and bring these emotions that were connected to it into the home. And you very much contrasted the peaceful er um, area of the home with the violence of war and the trauma of war. Now in the discussion about the Second World War, mm -hmm. um, some historians have said that actually um, trauma is a category that's relatively modern and only after the Second World War it actually became widely accepted. And that before that, um, violence in war wasn't as um, culturally experienced as traumatic as we would it today. So would it make sense to say that back then in the 18th century, war wasn't actually um, remembered as traumatic and as violent, but it was actually remembered as victory. And that yeah. these objects do not bring the memory of violence into the home because it's also a world w in which the home and the world around it isn't as de-violenced as it is today. And where you actually have more reminders of physical violence even in home spaces. Yeah, it's, it's an excellent series of questions. Um, and there's always a danger, right, when you're talking about the past um, and using modern categories like trauma, whether you are reading into the past something that was not understood or experienced the same way. And I think that's particularly fraught for anything psychological, because I think we do have a tendency to read our own understanding of human psychology back into time in ways that are perhaps ahistorical. In this case, though, I would say that although they might not have used the word trauma, um, I would say that they absolutely experienced it. And when you read their letters and you read their diaries, and, and this is for men and women alike, um, if you read captivity narratives of people who were um, captured by Native Americans or loyalists during the revolution um, and their reaction to that experience, if you read letters or diaries of reaction to the loss of loved ones in battle, um, there's an overwhelming sense of loss. Um, and it's, it's couched in language of sensibility often, you know, sort of 18th century sensibility much more so than it is what we would associate with trauma, but the emotional feeling is undeniably there. Um, and I think that it is something, and it is something that I found in, equally in soldiers' journals in the field and private letters at home. Um, so I, I would actually, I would push back against that and say, well, I completely appreciate the ahistorical, I don't want to have an ahistorical construction of what trauma is and how it's defined. I think that they were experiencing what we would think of as trauma, even if they weren't using the construction of the term themselves. Your point about the home is a really interesting and good one, though, because um, one of the things that I didn't use this phrase at all in this talk today, but when I teach the American Revolution, I'm always very careful to point out that it's a civil war. It's the first American civil war. You know, the, the, what we call the civil war in America was the second American civil war. Um, and I think this is really important to think about your point of violence in the home, um, the fact that and this, I think, is one of the reasons that um, those bullets are kept, right? Because they don't just damage human bodies, they damage the home. Um, and people are very fraught over damage to their property and their domestic spaces as well as to, um, as well as to their, the bodies of their loved ones and themselves. And if you read the Loyalist Claims Commission reports or if you read um, reports of patriots who come back to Newport, Rhode Island after the British have occupied it and pretty much destroyed a lot of the property in the town, um, you get an overwhelming sense of the 
magnitude of loss people feel at property that is not simply monetary. It's also a very emotional reaction to, um, to violence that occurred in their domestic and commercial spaces. And it's important to realize and point out, I think, that at this point, um, domestic and commercial spaces often overlapped. And so I think there's an economics at play there, too. Um, but I think that, that that is a very excellent point. And that's one of the reasons that I kept that little tiny bit about the bullets in the home in there, because I wanted to at least make a nod to the fact that what the spaces themselves are experiencing is also important. So thank you for that. Uh, Angel. Thanks, That's exceptionally rich material. I really enjoyed it. And that wallpaper is fantastic. You know, I, mean, <laughs> I really think that's fascinating. Um, my question is actually about kind of this trajectory you set out here between you know, where it's violence foregrounded and then violence kind of um, mm -hmm. obscured as it, as it goes through the century. And um, what I was thinking about is the role of Anglophilia and, and how this kind of continued dependence on British models are really important. Mm -hmm. And Kathleen Kelly's work in the Republic of mm -hmm. Taste as a visual culture approach. And, you know, uh, William Hamilton's The Woodlands as a way of using that as a way to kind of um, forget about his loyalist past and, you know, Jefferson and Abigail Adams all have this um, kind of need on it. And, you know, obviously, Anglophilia has that sort of question, and I wonder if I could ask specifically your thoughts on if there's a class dimension to this, whereby mm -hmm. the kind of um, markers of violence are maintained in these more ordinary peoples, and these obscurance of violence are much more elite objects. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's a fascinating question. Um, and in this case, obviously, just looking at those two, there's a very different price point between <laughs> the broad side on the left and the Edward Savage, um, which gets replicated in genteel young women's embroideries, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so that point is very well taken. Um, what I find interesting, though, is that, so the Arnolds, um, for example, the Musqueam necklace people, um, the first Rhode Island regiment was, um, became the regiment that accepted um, enslaved people and then freed them by an act of the Rhode Island legislature and became known as the All Black Regiment during the Revolution, even though it wasn't. It always had um, white enlisted men as well as white officers. But it's the regiment that's famous, um, if you know the watercolor that shows the, the black man in his white uniform, that's the Rhode Island Regiment. Um, so Arnold, I think he's white. I'm almost 100% sure he's white. But he's fighting in this, this integrated army, this integrated unit that is much it's, it's not the same as, as, you know, sort of being in Cadwallader or Colden's Silk Stocking Brigade in Philadelphia, right? It's a very different experience. Um, and after the war, he was, um, he was uh, a surveyor. So in other words, he's at a, the Arnolds are at a very different class level than, you know, these people. Um, and I think that that is an important point to make. Um, however, what I think is really interesting is that, the, again, the objects themselves are different in material and in level of aesthetic and in price point, but the sentiments expressed by Esther DeVere Reed and Sally Franklin Bache and the, these women who are the society leaders of Philadelphia at the time um, and the financial leaders as well is the exact same level of militancy that's expressed in the Muscovall necklace. It just takes a different form. Um, they're the type of women who have the leisure time to sew these shirts and embroider their names in them, right? So I think that that is, that is an issue that I probably need to bring out more clearly, and you're right about that. Um, I actually think what's fascinating about these objects is that they play out in different media and in different um, aesthetics, but they're communicating the same ideological messages, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, that, I think what I need to do is, is bring out that fact more clearly. Um, they also play to different, um, like I said, different regions, um, different ethnicities. Um, in Pennsylvania, there's evidence of things, interesting things happening with German um, Americans versus Anglo Americans. Um, and like I, I mentioned with the first Rhode Island Regiment, also race. So I think that's something that needs to be brought out more clearly. Um, but it's an excellent distinction to make. Again, incredibly rich uh, paper. Um, I think it is really convincing of this idea of domestic militancy of material culture that kind of blurs the separate spheres of men and women. But while I think the objects themselves are intertwined, I then think about commemoration, remembrance, mm -hmm. emotional things that are specifically gendered because of the gendered experience of men at battle and women waiting at home. I wonder then, 
how far these objects can blur those emotional psychological differences between them. Yeah, that's another that's another really intriguing question. Um, because it, it's always it, it's it's different to be the one who it's for example, obviously it's different to be Thomas Arnold and physically lose your leg than it is to be the wife who's sad that your husband lost his leg, right? I mean you're both experiencing a loss, but you're experiencing it in very different ways. And that's an obvious example. Um, and I think one of the things I'm focusing on here are objects they're all objects in which the women, I don't think a single object I have up here is a woman who's single. I think all of these are married women or women who were married at some point. And obviously if you are a widow or a single woman during the war, you have a very different experience of the war and its losses than, um, than you do if, if you are married, whether your husband dies or not. Um, and there are some actually some graduate students doing some really great work on widows and their experience in the revolution um, who I hope will offer some thoughts on this. Um, I mean, it's a really, it's a really fascinating question. Um, obviously, it's not the same experience. I think what's interesting is that it's this sort of attempt to build a shared experience when maybe there's not necessarily a shared experience that's a given. Um, and I think that the things are a way that this is happening. I'm not saying this very eloquently, but it, does that does that make sense? Yeah, there the, the, the must be. It's almost like a, a gift exchange. Which means exactly. Like bringing them together yeah, a really creepy together. one, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I agree. And, and and the baby shoes, I think, of as sort of the same way, right? Like they are they are brought back from battle, um, and given the fate of three of the man's brothers, I think they must have been associated with loss and grief, rather than simply unadulterated feelings of victory at having captured this coat and, you know, trounced the British ultimately. But how it was then translated into an object that has a particularly maternal and, in this time period, particularly maternal and particularly um, tender iteration of it, I think it's really fascinating and actually I think speaks really well to the point you're raising. So I saw Erica, then Marie, Thank you, Zara, for such a wonderful presentation. At the beginning, you talked about how your work bridges the gap between military history and the history of gender and consumption, going along with that. And I'm curious about the sort of material culture that's embedded in military history, that military historians often work with a different set of objects, mm -hmm. including weapons, mostly. And whether you see and how you're interpreting the inclusion of such objects in the home, not necessarily homespun, but things like guns that are brought back and then how they're displayed and how you're interpreting that the sort of militarizing of the home instead of necessarily domesticating the war. Mm -hmm. That's a great point too and obviously a lot of um, a lot of people make swords or guns very visible things just like they do the, the bullets for example. Um, and it's interesting if you look at a very easy example if you look at the differences between what George Washington bequeaths in his will that have particularly particular associations with the revolution versus what Martha bequeaths to whom that have particular associations with the revolution, it's a highly gendered. Obviously, it's highly gendered. You know, no no granddaughter of Martha's gets a sword, right? I mean, it's just not happening. Um, but I think that it's it is something that is parsing out along gendered lines um, in very expected ways in some respects, um, and it's probably something I need to give a nod to. A lot of these objects, what I like about them is that they're not, because of how they're being used in the space or what they are, they're not necessarily the purview of one or the other. Um, musket ball necklace being an obvious distinction, so it's not a you know blanket statement, but you know, men and women are sleeping in that bed together, right? They are walking through the hall with the wallpaper together. And so one of the things I find really fascinating about these most of these objects is that they are things that um, that are combined pieces of material culture. Maybe not at their inception, but over time they would be things that would be shared. So maybe this sort of gets to your point, right? Like how do you, in a way I think of something like, um, like those baby shoes as a way to mediate that unshared experience into a shared experience. Mm -hmm. And they're not being used in parts of the home that are explicitly gendered, like swords or rifles maybe going into 
the office or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> the man cave. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, I mean, again, yeah, and I'm thinking, again, to use the easy, quick version, and this is not a typical version, but it's on the tip of my head. Um, at Mount Vernon, right, in Washington's library, which is a very gendered masculine space, um, you have mementos from the war that are very gendered and that are kept there and that are um, things like weapons or busts of military heroes. Um, and then in the parlor, which is a shared space, um, you have some nods to the revolution. You have a massive portrait of Lafayette and his family, mm -hmm. right? But you don't have a sword. So it's, I think that's a really good point to bring up as well. And the parlor is more Martha's space at Mount Vernon, but it's used, it's not like the library exclusively a male space. It's used by um, men and women together too. But it's a fantastic point to bring up. Thank you for that. I need to bring the weapons back probably. Yes, I mean, obviously the subject here is domestication, bringing into the home, but I was just surprised that that there wasn't more, or maybe it just hasn't survived, but there wasn't more material that's religious in a sort of old mm. fashion. I mean, I know we're talking about on the whole Protestants here, and uh, it's not like medieval Europe, which is what I'm used to, but, but I'm just, um, I mean, there are obviously objects of piety and devotion mm -hmm. that are used in the home. And, is it just that they didn't survive, and, and, the, and which could be made to express, because of course also the forms of collaboration, with which the person over there mentioned, mm -hmm. are often related to prayer and to meditation, and there are you know, religious tracts about consolation and whatnot. So is it just something that you left out now, or is it something that doesn't really reveal itself in the material culture so readily? Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Um, I mean, obviously, your point is a very good one that religion is really important in this world, right? Um, whether you're Catholic or Protestant. Um, and I think the fact that Abigail Adams tacks on reciting that poem about the dead soldiers lying in their grave, <coughs> it's tacked on to the Lord's Prayer, right? So it's sort of, first right. there's the religious yes. Yes. ritual, and then there's the remembering the dead soldiers moldering in the clay ritual. Um, and I don't think that's accidental at all. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a reason for that. Um, the materiality, though, is another question altogether. I mean, the thing that pops immediately to mind, um, and I have no idea if any of these things made it back and were displayed or kept carefully in homes, um, would be when Benedict Arnold, um, when he was still on the right side, um, <laughs> he was leading a campaign into Canada, which was a disaster. Um, but one of the things that he and his men did was stop in Newburyport, Massachusetts, to listen to a sermon at the um, church where George Whitfield, the famous um, evangelical preacher, was buried, was where he was entombed. They listened to the sermon, and then they all went down to the crypt, and they cut off little bits of his shirt to carry with them into yes. battle. So that's, I mean, that's actually a very Catholic thing, right? Um, talismans, literally. Um, like I said, it didn't go well for them, but it would be, <laughs> it would, so maybe, maybe that explains something, but, but it would, ex but less flippantly, it would explain maybe, um, it would be interesting to know whether any of those men brought those bits of cloth back and then displayed or used them, and this would be a little bit of a needle in the haystack to sure. examine, but it's a fascinating question because obviously people were, um, were relying on religious um, conviction and spirituality. Um, and as you probably know, one of the, one of the big changes that um, Congress insisted, um, the Committee of Five insisted Jefferson make to his original draft of the Declaration is to insert more references to the Supreme Being, more references to divine guidance, because um, Jefferson's version wasn't quite that spiritual in its overtone. Um, so obviously this is something that's really important to them. That I'm, I'm just struggling to think of a material example other than those bits of cloth, but there have to be some. Does anyone know of any? Is that something that pops to mind for anyone? <coughs> but I'll definitely give that some thought because I think that's a really rich way to think about it. Um, soldiers in Sullivan's campaign in New York also, um, they would sometimes, um, they would stop where they knew bodies were and they would, um, they would specifically say prayers, um, men who had been killed by loyalists and Native American allies. They would say prayers, and then they would sometimes leave um, 
erect markers where they knew the blood had been spilled. And they would very specifically say, here's the blood of, you know, Lieutenant so-and-so who was savagely murdered by the cruel British and Indians. And so I think that's also a very religiously driven interpretation of what's going on there. Um, but interesting, I can't think of the domestic parallel other than Abigail Adams, but I, I will definitely give it thought. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. This was um, incredibly dense and, you know, um, I'm a 19th century person, so this was very, very interesting for me. Um, I, it, so I don't have fully formed questions, so bear with me. I just, it seems to me that throughout your presentation, there's something about the patriarch body. Um, you know, you showed us this extract from this poem about the rotting bodies of soldiers that had to be commemorated somehow. There's, to me, this wife who seems to want to reclaim her husband's leg you know, <laughs> by displaying the bullets on her own body. Um, and then there's something about this little creepy shoes <laughs> that are being fit on a child's body, you know, on the feet. And then you have these women sort of like creating shirts for soldiers going into battle. So again, mm -hmm. something that they wear on on their body, you know, apart from the tapestry and, and the portraits, there's something very sort of embodied about the whole yeah. experience of um, well, those have bodies on too. In, in the revolution, whether you're on the battlefield or, or not. And I agree with you that I think those uh, objects all sort of blur gender boundaries, but they also <coughs> are, I think, a way to like make everyone participate in the moral effort. You know, even the children wearing their shoes will think of themselves as patriots mm -hmm. and how. Um, so I just wonder if you can think of maybe speak about the kind of the body aspect of it all. I know it's not a fully formed question, but um, it strikes me as being a very interesting way of commemorating, um, or not even commemorating, just like experiencing more, you know, through objects that you physically really have with you. And I think you could even take out the domestic sphere mm. as well. So maybe there's something beyond the home, you know, or you might want to think about domesticity as just the nation, the land geographically as well. But yeah. Yeah, and I think I think um, that completely works as an analogy, um, both because Americans did at the time think of the domestic as having both of those meanings, right? Individual homes and then the sort of larger nation, um, and you get you get that very clearly in how they talk about manufactured goods. But I think you also could get it um, in a sort of more metaphorical, political um, way, body politic <laughs> way as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because a lot, of the, a lot of the connections and concerns are related to the body. You're absolutely right. And I would say even something like this, you know, they're human figures, right? It's yes, and then the Washington portraits as well, you know, you have the body of the patriarch as well, the patriarch um, mm -hmm. um, And it, it is something it's, I'm, I'm trying now to think if there are, I'm sort of second guessing my own answer and thinking if there are any, um, any sort of decorative motifs that pop to mind that are other than the flag that don't involve a body that are commonly used. And I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, I think it's an excellent point, And I think that there is a lot to be said about, especially what's going on here from a multi-generational standpoint. Um, because I think one of the most important things that's going on after the revolution is this um, idea that you, know, you sort of, you fought, you won, what do you do now, right? How it's one thing to galvanize um, this group of what we're all, after all, mostly young people. You know, think about the signers of um, the Declaration of Independence and the men who fought with Washington in the Continental Army. For the most part, it's a youngish group of people, right? So how do you get them to pass that on to the people who were three in 1780, right? And I think that material culture is one of the ways this is happening. Um, but it's interesting to think about the body in the sense of um, intimate connections to, which I'm teaching a graduate reading seminar on the material history of the body in the Atlantic world next semester, so I'm going to make my smart graduate students think of this issue. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got time for one last question, which was really <coughs> Oh, I, actually, I was not going to ask a question, but just make a quick point about um, the essentially gendered nature of war. I think that it's easy for us to think of these men is going off to battle somewhere, but these battles are happening very close to home. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that the people at home were having and viewing and experiencing mm -hmm. the violence of war intimately. Um, and then after the war, these women were also caring for their men's bodies, so that touches mm -hmm. on your point yeah. too. You know, and that's that's again a very visceral, violent experience that really is, I think, 
an actual war experience. Yeah, absolutely, and that's something that um, that I imply, but don't come right out and say that I should come right and because obviously the fact that Abigail Adams can take her son to see the battle means it's really close. <laughs> you know, I mean that's and that's a fact that is very disturbing if you're you know if it's that that close. And the women in Philadelphia, I think one of the reasons they were undoubtedly so militant is that they suffered British occupation of the city, and yeah. many of them, Sally Franklin Bache included, she basically got on a horse, you know, not long after giving birth and had to flee town with, yeah. you know, because she was a target as Benjamin Franklin's daughter. So I think that's a really important point to make. Um, I mean, it is a domestic war. Yeah, and it ties in with the whole civil war thing that yeah. I mentioned before. So, so I think you're right. I think that's one of the, I think I need to zoom out from the objects and engage with that fact, because I think that is part of the landscape. But I think it's contained yeah, the landscape, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're absolutely right. Well, there were a few other hands going off in the room, but uh, I never like to keep people from their drinks. And uh, <laughs> we are now at 25 too. So I think, especially uh, keeping our speakers from our drink after such a fantastic uh, uh, sort of lecture performance experience um, would be wrong. So I think what I'll say is thank you so much, Zara. Thank you all for your questions. Thank you.